Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here again. I had the privilege of being here last year. And uh, I'm going to move this over so that I'm a little bit more centrally located. Is that going to cause the cameraman to, get, to go crazy on me? I just, I don't like, uh, I like being in the middle of where you all are just sitting. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be back. And I, I know that conferences like this are sort of like taking a drink out of a fire hydrant. It just sort, of, just sort of all comes at once, and it can be an awful lot of information. But I'm afraid I'm going to have to add to that <laughs> in, in the next hour, because I want, to, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about how do we know there is a God. And you, you know, I'm sure, <clears throat> that we live in a culture where there's a lot of mythology out there. Uh, Bill Maher said just recently about Rick Santorum, uh, that he was uh, ignorant because he had his kids homeschooled in order to protect his kids from having to be exposed to reason. Uh, the truth of the matter is homeschool kids do better on SAT scores than non-homeschool kids. <laughs> so Bill Maher was just spewing a myth. It was just nothing but a pure myth. And there's another myth that is widely believed today that is not true. It's just flat not true. And it's the idea that belief in God is a matter of blind faith, not reason. You can't actually know there's a God. You're stuck with having to hope there's a God or to believe there's a God or to, in something like that, but you can't actually know God exists. Now, this is just not the case. It's possible to know God exists. By the way, you can know something without being certain of it. Uh, knowledge is a true belief that's based on adequate reasons. And we have knowledge that God is real, even though you may still have questions and even though you may not be 100% certain that there's a God, you can know he's there uh, with a degree of cert certitude that's short of 100%, but enough to count as knowledge. So it's possible to know that there is a God. And uh, when you take a look at the Bible and ask the question of Scripture, how do we know there is a God? The Bible indicates that it isn't, first of all, by personal experience of God, though that does play a role. And it isn't, we don't know there's a God because the Bible teaches that. We know that God exists because of the creation. Psalm 19 and Romans 1 both indicate that the knowledge that there is a supreme being that we are responsible to comes from the nature of the created world itself. So that the creation then provides adequate evidence of the existence of a supreme being. Now, I don't think that you need to, to have to put that evidence in the form of an argument to know that God is there. I'll illustrate that. My parents were blue-collar workers. My mom worked at a cup factory her whole life. My dad was a welder, never went to college. <clears throat> they would look at the created world and knew God was real. But I couldn't my mom and my dad couldn't formulate an argument for God's existence based upon this evidence they saw in creation. They went from the evidence to God in an intuitive kind of way. They could intuitively sense that the evidence, the design in the universe, the fact that there was a world here at all and it had to come from somewhere was sufficient for them to know God was real. So I want to draw a distinction between knowing God is there based on the evidence of creation on the one hand and being able to formulate an argument for God's existence based on that evidence on the other hand. I don't think you have to be able to do that to be able to know God is there from the evidence of creation. Now having said that, there is still the question, is it possible to formulate an argument for God's existence based upon the evidence of creation that would stand up in a court of law or, or uh, 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 in, in the front of thoughtful people? And I think the answer to that is yes, and I'm going to do that uh, in the time that we have left. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a handful of arguments for how it is that we can know God exists, and then I'm going to try to, if we have time, I'm going to try to show how you would move from that case to why Christianity is opposed to Islam or Judaism or some other monotheistic religion. How do we know there's a God? The first piece of evidence that gives us knowledge that there is a supreme being 
comes from the discovery that the universe began to exist. It is now, I believe, beyond reasonable doubt that the space-time physical universe began to exist. It has not been here forever. It has been around for, say, 13.6 billion years. It doesn't matter to me if it's that old or if it's 50,000 years old. That doesn't make any difference to me. What's obvious is that the universe of space, time, and matter came into existence at a point in the past, and it has not been here forever. Now, there are two lines, there, there are several lines of evidence for that, but let me give you two lines of evidence that I think are persuasive in establishing the fact that the universe began to exist. The first is scientific, and then the second one, which I think is even stronger, is a philosophical piece of evidence. So this first evidence that we know that the universe began to exist comes from science, and it comes from a principle called the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics. I'm, I'm going to state this in a way that's understandable. If you've had engineering or science background, you know that the second law involves a concept called entropy or something that we might call useful energy or disorder. But the second law basically says that the universe is running out of useful energy. It is running out of useful energy. And you might want to think of the universe as a whole as a clock that is winding down or as a car that is running out of gasoline. Um, The universe is burning up its useful energy. In fact, Time Magazine, a few years ago, did a cover story on how the universe would end. And it indicated that there would come a day in the future when at least two things were going to happen. The first is all the lights are going to shut off because all the chemical and nuclear reactions that are generating light are going to shut down and the universe is going to be completely dark. In addition to that, the universe is going to run out of heat and it will eventually cool down to absolute zero and it's going to have no pockets of heat because the universe is using up its fuel. Now, if the second law of thermodynamics implies that the universe is using up its useful energy the, as, as chemical reactions process, they, the energy goes from useful energy to useless energy. And the net balance is always towards the side of losing useful energy or things becoming more disordered. If that's happening, it follows that the universe had to have a beginning. Because if the universe did not have a beginning, then it would have been using up its useful energy forever. And that follows that it would have already reached a point where it would no longer have any useful energy infinitely long ago. See, if the universe was using up its energy forever and ever and ever, its useful energy, it would have reached a point of equilibrium or of of zero uh, uh, light and heat infinitely long ago. Since that hasn't happened, the, the, the gas tank had to have been filled up at some point in the past and it's been using fuel since then. Since the tank hasn't used all of its fuel yet, it couldn't have been being driven forever because if someone had been driving that car forever, it would have already run out of gas. Now that establishes to me that space, time, and matter began to exist. It's interesting to note that Lord Kelvin, who is one of the original discoverers of thermodynamics, immediately drew the conclusion that the universe had not been here forever, that it had to have a beginning. And that's the first piece of argument. The second reason that we know the universe began to exist comes from a philosophical argument uh, about the impossibility of crossing infinity. And it goes, the idea is that it's impossible for anything, including God himself, to cross infinity. Uh, This comes from the very nature of infinity itself, that infinity is something that can't be crossed. Now, there are technical arguments for this, but I'll just make a, a practical assertion, and it's this. Infinity is infinitely larger than any finite number. 
So infinity is infinitely larger than 100. And it's infinitely larger than uh, 50 billion. Um, do you understand why that has to be true? Suppose that infinity were only finite larger than a finite number. Then you could take the first finite number and add the second finite number and you'd get infinity, but you wouldn't, you'd get a finite number. <laughs> so infinity has got to be infinitely larger than any particular finite number or it wouldn't be infinity. Now, given that infinity is that large, it's infinitely larger than any finite number, it becomes impossible for anything to cross infinity one event at a time. So suppose I went to heaven and God says, Moreland, you were a good guy, but you kind of, a couple of those lectures you gave were sort of weak. And uh, so what we have, in fact, people walked out on you in the middle of your talks and all kinds of stuff. No, it's okay. So <laughs> she's never going to do that again, is she? <laughs> okay. So, so we're, we're glad to have you up here. But that's the good news. The bad news is I want you to count the natural numbers forever. So I start counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and I get up to 50 quadrillion zillion. And some other person dies and goes to heaven and gets the same assignment, and this person's at the number 75. They just got started. And I'm at 50 quadrillion zillion. And I look over to this poor person and think, boy, you're way behind me. Until it dawns on me. I haven't made any progress because we both have the same amount of numbers left to count, an infinite number. So no matter how far I go, I would never, I would never be coming any closer to finishing my task because the task is literally infinite. Now, let's suppose that this is, this is the present moment. Let's freeze right now and say this is the present moment and let's draw a line in the past. And this is a year ago this is 50 years ago, this is 50 billion years ago, this is 50 trillion years ago. And if there was not a beginning to the universe, how far does this line go? Goes infin infinitely far in the past. Is there an edge on the line? If there were an edge on the line, what would that be? That would be a finite beginning. So if the universe never had a beginning, the past has gone on forever. You with me? Now, if you can't go from zero to positive infinity, you can't go from minus infinity to zero because it's the same distance. But do you see if the universe never began, in order to reach the present moment down there, which we've marked zero, minus one, minus 50, minus 50 billion, you'd have to go from minus infinity to zero, which means if the universe never began to exist, the present moment could have never showed up. Just think about it for a minute. Why could it have never showed up? Because the universe, in order to reach this moment, would have to have crossed through an infinite number of earlier moments to get here, and that can't happen. Now, it's even more interesting than that, because at least if you're going to go from zero to positive infinity, you can get started. You can't, get fin you can't finish, but at least you can get started. That's like trying to go into zero from zero to positive infinity is like trying to jump out of a pit that's infinitely tall without edges, but at least it's got a floor. Going from minus infinity to zero is like trying to jump out of a bottomless infinite pit. Not only will you never get out, you can't even get started because <laughs> there's no place to get a foothold in inside the series to get moving for pick any event into the past. Pick an event 50 quadrillion years ago. Could the universe have reached that event? No. What about an event further past? Could the universe have at least reached that event? No. So it turns out the universe from a beginningless situation not only can't finish crossing to the present, it can't even get started. And this is an incredibly important argument for the fact that the universe began to exist. Space, time, and matter began to exist. Even God can't cross infinity. God has been alive about 13.5 billion years. Now, without the universe, God is timeless. God didn't exist earlier than the beginning of the universe. It's not like, here's the beginning of the universe and God was back further. Because without a universe, there was no time and God just existed timelessly. You with me? 
So suppose that I lived outside of a lake, but I, ju I jumped into the lake three hours ago. How long would I be in the lake? Three hours. God's been in time for 13.5 billion years. But without time, he didn't start existing 13.5 billion years ago. He just jumped into the lake. He created it and jumped into it. <laughs> But without time, God exists timelessly. So even God hasn't been in time forever. Because without the universe, God is outside time. Are we feeling any love? <laughs> Are we bonding? Is there any bonding happening? All right. Okay. Now, folks, something had to create the universe. Something had to cause space, time, and matter to come into existence. How do I know that? Because you cannot get something in, coming into existence from nothing. nothing. You can't get something from pure nothing. Some scientists claim that you can get universes. I guess there's a new book out by the physicist uh, Kra Leon Krauss who claims that you can get universes coming into existence from nothing. When you look at what nothing is for him, it's a quantum vacuum, which is not nothing. It's governed by laws. It's, it's composed of fields. So he's not giving you an example of getting something from nothing. He's giving you an example of getting something from something. And the problem we've got is that the universe came into existence from nothing. That's the problem we've got. So, um, parenthesis, be very careful listening to scientists because a lot of times they're speaking in the public eye about issues for which they're not trained and they may be incredibly well, they may teach at Cornell or, or an Ivy League school and be really good in their, in their narrow area of physics. But when they start talking about metaphysics, they've got about a, about a freshman in college worth of training, a lot of them. And they make just stupid statements. And that includes Stephen Hawking. These are brilliant men who should stay in their fields and not try to make statements to the news media about things they're not trained for. <laughs> And just be careful about, be very careful listening when a scientist makes pronunciations outside their area of training. Okay, now the universe came into existence then, and, and what we've got is something had to cause it because you cannot get something from nothing. You understand if you get X from Y, like if you get a cake from, from materials, the materials have got to already exist, eggs and flour, or if you get one billiard ball moving from the, the contact of another billiard ball, so the motion of one billiard ball came from, there's the word from again, the motion of the other billiard ball, you've got to have the first billiard ball existing and in motion, don't you? Those are cases of getting one thing from something else. You can't get something from nothing in that way. Otherwise, you're treating nothing as though it's some kind of a weird something, which is what Krauss does. He says, nothing's a quantum vacuum. So let's imagine now what it is that had to cause the universe to begin to exist. It has to be spaceless because it could exist without space. It gave rise to space, okay? So it had to be capable of existing without the thing it created. Secondly, it's timeless. Why? Because it existed and created time, and it was able to exist without the thing it created. Third, it's immaterial. It's not physical. It's an immaterial entity. It's, it's a spiritual, immaterial sort of thing. It's not made out of matter. Again, why? Because matter started existing 13 and a half billion years ago. And there wasn't matter prior to that. Um, it has to be... Um, um, supernatural in the sense that it is able to act independently of the laws of nature. Why? Because those laws of nature only work once you've got a universe. The laws of nature don't generate the universe. They only start becoming applicable once you've got a universe. You with me? The rules of football can't explain where football came from. The rules of football might explain why people pass on third down and long, 
But so the rules of football work once you've got football, but you can't use the rules of football to explain where football itself came from. Similarly, the laws of nature work once you've got a universe, but those laws can't explain the origin of the very thing you need, the universe, before the laws start working in the first place. So what we have to have is a supernatural cause. It can't be a natural cause. By supernatural, I mean something that is able to act and transcend the laws of nature, to, to act miraculously, if you will. And it has to be the sort of a thing that has the power of free will. It has to be able to simply generate a universe, you might even say by speaking, <laughs> if you'd like, but it has to be able to generate a universe without anything causing it to do so. Because if something caused it to generate the universe, that thing's causing it to generate the universe would itself be the beginning of the universe. So whatever caused the beginning of the universe has to be able to do so freely. And now what we've got is the idea that the beginning of the universe came from a spiritual mind of some kind with the power of free will that was spaceless, temporal, and supernatural. Now, somebody may say to you, well, who caused God? And the answer is no one because God has always been here. God doesn't need a cause. Well, then why does the universe need a cause? Because it started 13 and a half billion years ago. That's why we know it began to exist. So the universe does need a cause, but God doesn't because God is, is a necessary being. Now let me explain this to you in a way that I hope will communicate about God being a necessary being. When I claim that God is a necessary being, I'm claiming that if there is a God, He cannot not exist. He couldn't die someday and stop existing. Because if there is a God... God doesn't owe his existence to something else that could pull the plug on him. God has existence in himself, and therefore he can't lose it. Okay, he's a necessary being. Now, is that a, is, why would we want to believe that God's a necessary being? Let me try to explain this in the following way. Suppose we have person A here, and person A wants to borrow an iPod, and he goes to B and says, may I borrow your iPod? And B says, no problem. I don't own one, but I've got a friend who's got one. I'll get it for you and loan it to you. So B goes to C and says, I've got a friend A, and I, he needs an iPod. Could I borrow yours and give it to him? And C says, sure. I don't have an iPod, but I've got a friend D who's got one, and I'll loan it to you, and you can give it to B, and he can give it to A. Well, notice that if we keep on doing this, poor old A down here is never going to get an iPod. <laughs> and the reason is because each member of the chain is a borrowing lender. Each member of the chain can only lend if he first borrows because the, each member of the chain is not a possessing lender. He's a borrowing lender. Does that make sense to you? Now, instead of iPods, let's go with existence. Here's something that exists but owes its existence to something else. Unfortunately, this thing had to get its existence from something else before it could give its existence to that thing. And if you keep adding beings of that type, nothing would exist because each member in the chain had to borrow existence from something else first before it could pass on existence to something else. You have to stop this sorry mess in the iPod case with a non-borrowing owner, something that just has existence in himself and doesn't have to borrow one, and with existence, or an iPod in himself, with existence you have to stop with a first existent being a being that just exists in himself and didn't get existence from something else. Now, that's why it doesn't make any sense for, for Richard Dawkins to say, who designed the designer? The answer is nobody, because the designer is a self-existent being. 
And the reason you've got to postulate a self-existent being is that if you keep on adding beings that ex had to borrow existence to pass it on, you get an infinite regress and nothing would exist. That's the problem with that. So, so if you ask me, how do I know there's a God? One of the first things I'm going to say is that I'm now firmly convinced that we live in a very interesting universe. What do I mean interesting? A universe that hasn't been here forever. It is now, in my view, beyond reasonable doubt that we live in a finite past. The, the, the past, however long it was, is not an issue for me right now, but the universe began to exist. And something supernatural that had the power of free will, that was not physical, not subject to the laws of nature, was not in space and time, caused the universe to come into existence. And whatever that person-like thing was, that was a necessary being. It was something that didn't get existence from something else to avoid the chain going forever and nothing existing. So now, guess what? This being that caused the beginning of the universe is going to be invisible. He's not going to be capable of being seen with the senses. Why? Because the senses can only see objects that have boundaries. Like a chair has a boundary to it. It has a finite location. You can see a chair because it's got finite boundaries. This being is not a material object of any kind so it, and is incapable of being observed with the five senses. There will be other ways of knowing he's there by direct communication. One of the ways is that he will be inclined to directly communicate with the mind by implanting thoughts and feelings in us as we seek him, though there are occasions when he does speak to people by sounds and, and through other, other means. But he himself will be, strictly speaking, invisible because of the nature of the being that he is. So now that's the first reason I believe in God. The second reason I believe in God uh, involves the various kinds of design that we have discovered in the universe, the various kinds of design that we've discovered in the universe. Let me mention two kinds to you. You maybe have heard of Anthony Flew. Maybe you haven't. Anthony Flew from the mid to late 50s up until six, seven, eight years ago. So for over 50 years was the intellect, dominant intellectual atheist in the Western world. He was a philosopher at the University of London and he became a believer in God seven or eight years ago. Because, not because he wanted to, but because of the new evidence for God that he didn't know existed. And it caused him to change his mind. And one of the pieces of evidence is the evidence I'm now going to give you. And this involves the fine-tuning of the universe. The f what's called fine-tuning. Scientists discovered a number of facts about the universe. For example, the, 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 the rest mass of a proton, the mass that a proton has, or exactly how much charge there is on an electron. You've heard that electrons are negatively charged. And there's a certain specific amount of charge that an individual electron carries, and they've been able to measure that out to several decimal places. They've been able to measure the mass of a proton and how, how heavy it is, you might say, uh, to several decimal places. Um, and there are something like anywhere from 30 to 60 of these numbers that they've been able to discern. One, is one for example, is the strength of gravity in the universe. It's, and more specifically, the value of the gravitational constant g in Newton's laws of gravity. But let's don't, if you don't know what I just said, just think about the strength. They've been able to measure the strength of gravity in the universe. They've also been able to determine that the galaxies are expanding away from one another, and they've been able to measure to several decimal points the rate of acceleration that the, that the galaxies are going through as they expand away from one another. Now, all of that might go yada, yada, yada to you. This is interesting if you're into science. 
that we've been able to discover the values of some 30, 40, 50, maybe 60 of these constants of nature. What we didn't know was that you can only have living things if these numbers turn out to be exactly what they are. If any one of these numbers had been slightly larger or smaller on the order of a billionth of a percentage point, you can get no living self-replicating systems anywhere in the universe. So if an electron had been a billionth of a percentage point more negatively charged or less negatively charged, you get no living things. Now, when you stop to think about this, this is an absolutely staggering fact that's been discovered. And the best explanation for this fact is that these numbers were chosen ahead of time so that life could be supported by the universe. If these numbers had been slightly different in either direction, you get no living things. To put the point differently, life-permitting universes are delicately tuned to these numbers. These numbers, all of these numbers have to be a very specific value in order for there to be life. Life-denying universes, universes where a proton is slightly heavier than it is, and so on, are, you, are much more likely to happen where you can have no living things. And this can be explained most naturally by saying that the dice were rigged ahead of time so that life could appear. Now, the atheist explanation of this fact is called a multiple universe scenario, where the atheist says, well, we have an infinite number of parallel universes. Now, you don't want to think of these universes as universes within our universe. These are literally an infinite number of parallel universes for which we have no scientific evidence. You can't interact with them causally. You can't observe them. You can't measure them. They are utter posits, and they are literally parallel universes. You have doubles in some of these universes. If you had an opportunity to become a lawyer but went into business, let's say, in one of these parallel universes, you have a double who's actually a lawyer. Uh, and and uh, there are some people that are claiming that in this infinite number of parallel universes, each one has a different mass for the mass of a proton. Each one has a slightly different value for the charge of an electron. Each one has a slightly different value for the force of gravity. You with me on that at this point? So they're all displayed. And which universe are we going to show up in? Well, it's going to be the one that's right for us, of course. There's nothing here to explain. Because, because we've got an infinite number of alternatives available, if you're with me on that. So we shouldn't be surprised that we showed up in the universe that was right for us. Which other one would you expect this to show up in? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad argument for a number of reasons. For one thing, there really is no independent evidence that these parallel universes exist, ap apart from the fact that they allow you to avoid God. Secondly, the theistic hypothesis is simpler than the infinite universe hypothesis. Because the theistic hypothesis postulates one universe and one supreme being, and that's a simpler explanation than postulating an infinite number of universes. So based on the principle of simplicity, one ought to, one ought to choose the theistic hypothesis over the multiple worlds hypothesis. There's one other problem with the multiple worlds hypothesis. And that is that, that, unfortunately, it can explain everything that was done on purpose. Let me illustrate. I'm, uh, we're playing cards, we're playing poker, and ten, 10 hands in a row, I deal myself four aces. Yeah, I'm a cheat. I mean, hello? You, I mean, of course I'm cheating. But you say to me... You lousy cheat, and I'm saying, you, you, no, there's an infinite number of universes where we're playing cards, <laughs> and sooner or later, in one of those universes, I'm going to deal four, ten hands in a row with four aces. 
Well, that would, you, you could explain it away based on a multiple worlds ensemble theory. You understand? But of course, that would be an absurd thing to say. So if we start explaining the actions of intel, intentional agents, a God who intended these values to be what they needed to be for life to appear, by appealing to these multiple ensembles, then where do you draw the line with using that to explain why I'm not cheating when I got 10 hands of four aces uh, in the, on the first deal in a row? So the, the explanation uh, should be avoided. So, so the second reason I believe in God is that we've discovered that the universe turned out to be very, very delicately hand-selected in terms of the mass of a proton, the charge of an electron, and so on, just within a very narrow window of what they needed to be so life could show up. And it looks to me like it was planned ahead of time. That's the best explanation. The third um, reason I believe in God is, is the information in living things. The information in living things. Let me just um, talk this through with you. I'll, I'm going to do this and give you one other, uh, one other argument, then I'll try to explain why Christianity. But this one goes like this. You've heard of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence that was in the movie Contact with Jodie Foster, and, and you know that they've just got another grant to look for life in outer space, which I don't think they're going to find. That's not the important point here. The important point is that they have developed a test for how to discover the presence of an intelligent agent. And it's if they discover a signal that contains information. Now contrast information with randomness, like if I had alphabet soup and just tossed it up in the air and it landed, that would be random. And when they beam their scanners into outer space and hear random noise, they don't draw any conclusions from that. Second is, is, would be a signal that contains simple order, like M-E, 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 500 times, or just a pulsating radio wave that just pulsates like that. Again, if they discover a signal that is a simple ordered oscillating wave, they're not going to conclude that that should be explained by intelligent life in outer space. <clears throat> but in the movie Contact, they discovered, I think it was the first 20 prime numbers in a row, or was it at least all the prime numbers between, what was it, th th uh, 3 and 101 or something of that sort. The point is that if you discovered a signal like that in outer space that contained information, you darn well better postulate that it came from an intelligent mind. Because information only comes from minds. Consider the signal John loves Mary. It would be most reasonable to postulate that that came from an intelligent mind. And I think they're right about that. That information is best explained as, as, being a, as originating in an intelligent agent that created that information. So there's randomness, no need for an intelligent agent. Simple order, no need for an intelligent origin information, you need to postulate a, an intelligence that caused that information signal. But I think what should be obvious is the biggest discovery in biology of the 20th century is that living things are filled with information. They call it the genetic code. It can be translated and transcribed. And DNA is literally teeming with information. So my point is, if it makes sense to say that information is best explained by an intelligent agent of some kind, why shouldn't the volumes of information in a DNA molecule also be explained by postulating a very, very smart intelligence that was behind it? I see no good reason not to follow the argument wherever it leads, and if it leads in our favor, so be it. If you're going to play this game and go with this kind of evidence, which I think is a legitimate piece of evidence, if we found an archaeological dig that had information in it, we wouldn't say erosion caused that. We'd say it came from an intelligent culture, wouldn't we? Why not the information in DNA? So there is the third reason I believe in God is because I don't think that you can explain the origin of information, and neither do the SETI scientists, 
without saying that it came from an intelligent designer of some kind, since living things are filled with libraries of information, the most reasonable explanation, I think, is that there's a very, very sophisticated intellect that stands behind that information. Origin of the universe, fine-tuning of the universe, the origin of biological information, and the next piece of evidence that I would submit involves the existence of an absolute moral law and one other feature of it that I'll mention in a minute. Now, when I talk about an absolute moral law, what I mean is an objective moral law that's true whether anyone believes it. I mean an objective moral law that's true whether anybody believes it or not. So the objective moral law is like the laws of math. We, we don't invent the laws of math. We what? We discover them. We don't invent the laws of morality. We discover those laws. They're already out there. Now, in the Nuremberg trials, um, one of the Nazi war criminals defended himself by appealing to moral relativism. He said, everything is relative. What gives you the right to tell us in Germany what we should or shouldn't do? There are no absolutes. And the judge said, you're forgetting that there is a law above the law. And he meant that there are human laws invented by human cultures, but there's also a law that is above those human cultural norms in light of which we are legitimately able to judge whether a culture is immoral or not by appealing to that law above the law. That's what I mean by an absolute moral law. Now, if somebody says they don't believe in an absolute moral law, and some of you have heard me do this before, what you want to do is you want to find out something that they care deeply about, treat it as though it's nothing but relative, and see what happens and they will suddenly become an absolutist. Um, so I found a guy years ago that loved, uh, that told me he was a relative. So we got to talking at this store. I was buying something. I have no idea how we got in the conversation. Got in ethical issues or whatever. And he said, yeah, I think everything's relative. Whatever's true for you is fine. Whatever's true for me is fine. Well, I found out the guy loved the environment. So I said to him, hey, you know, I got a group of four buddies, and the five of us get together once a month, kick 50 bucks a piece into a kitty. We buy a 100-gallon drum of sulfuric acid, and we drive out to Lake Paris in Southern California here, and we dump the, the acid in the lake, and we've taken bets as to how many fish we're going to kill ahead of time. And whoever gets closest to the number of fish that float to the surface wins the rest of the kitty. And I said, it's, it's actually pretty exciting. <laughs> and, you know, is that, is that fish really dead? Does it count? Is it at the surface, or is it too... Does it have to be to the surface to count? You know, it's just, we get into arguments. It's a great time. Well, of course, the guy's blood vessels were popping. And I said to him, you know, I'm not an expert in body language, but it looks like th that you think what my friends and I are doing is wrong. And I said, it occurs to me that you're, you're not a relativist. You're an absolutist in the areas of your lifestyle that matter to you. You're a relativist when it's convenient to your lifestyle, probably in sexual morality stuff like that. Everybody's an absolutist. Everybody knows that there are moral absolutes. The problem is, where in the world could these things come from? How can you get moral duties and moral obligations imposed on the entire human community from outside? Well, we all know where impositions and duties come from. They come from imposers. <laughs> Agents, lawgivers. So the most reasonable explanation, not the only explanation, you can just posit it's there and it's somehow just there. But if you're going to give an explanation to where this came from, and I think it requires an explanation, the most reasonable explanation is that the absolute moral law came from a good moral lawgiver, God. Without a theistic explanation for the origin of the objective moral law, it becomes very difficult to explain how there could be such a thing. And that's why so many, not all, but so many atheists are indeed relativists. They're relativists. Now, in addition to this, uh, the existence of the absolute moral law, 
Um, there is the e issue of equal human rights for all human persons. And there's been a great concern about rights violations in Sudan, and there were in Tiananmen Square in China, and uh, it is widely accepted that all human beings, all human persons, should have equal human rights simply because they're human persons. The problem is that doesn't make much sense if there isn't a God, and specifically if there isn't a Judeo-Christian God. And here's why. Here's why it doesn't make sense. My daughter came home in elementary school with a Martin Luther King flyer that said all people ought to be treated equally. And I said, do you believe that? She said, yeah. And I said, why in the world would you believe something like that? Well, because of God, Dad. Just thinking she'd get rid of me. So I said, look over on the, in the living room there on the wall behind the sofa. We have a very lovely painting that your mom and I bought. It's a very, very nice painting. Beautiful. Look on the coffee table. There's a piece of paper I wadded up forgot to throw in the trash before I went to bed. If the house were burning down and you could only save one, the painting or the piece of trash, do you think that you ought to save one of them and not the other? Or do you think it wouldn't matter so you could flip a coin and save whatever it landed on? She said, well, I shouldn't do that. I said, why not? She said, I ought to save the painting. Why? Well, it's more valuable than that piece of paper. Okay. I said, what about if it was a choice between that piece of trash and our, and our pet dog? Well, of course, she said, I'm going to save Cody, uh, Casey, our dog. And so I said, what we learn, honey, is the following lesson. Equals ought to be treated equally, and unequals ought to be treated unequally. If you have equal things, those equal things shouldn't be treated unequally. If I have two papers that are both A grades, I shouldn't give one an A and the other an F. Okay? You also should treat unequal things unequally. You shouldn't treat a, a pet dog with the same value as a piece of paper and flip a coin to decide who you're going to say. That's immoral. Why? Because the dog has got more value than that piece of trash paper. And if you were to do that, you would be treating unequal things as though they were equal. And that's immoral. Now I said, do you realize humans don't have anything in common that's equal? They're smart and dumb, good-looking, ugly, athletic, non-athletic, artistic, non-artistic, socially useful, socially useless human beings. We haven't got anything in common that's, that's equal. She said, yeah, we do. What is it? Belly buttons. <laughs> okay? It's an insightful answer. And I said, but there are people with large and small belly buttons. Do people with large ones have more value than those with small ones? I said, furthermore, if your belly button is where you get your value... If we took your sister to the doctor and had her belly button cut out, could we use her as a doorstop? <laughs> because she'd lose her source of value. So I said, we learned two lessons. A, if equal rights is going to make sense, we've got to have something in common that's equal. B, whatever it is we have in common that's equal, it can't be trivial and silly, like a belly button. It's got to, be, it's got to have gravitas. It's got to be big and weighty. The image of God fulfills that role. Now, I, I don't have time to go into detail on this. I gave this argument at, the, at Claremont College, and an atheist in the audience says, well, look, even if there's no God, we're still all human beings. What he failed to realize is, number one, if God doesn't exist and evolution is how we got here, there is no such thing as being a human being. There is a set of individual humans that resemble one another to a greater or lesser degree, so we're not all equally human on an evolutionary scenario. For those of you who know a little bit about this, this means that evolutionary theory rejects essentialism when it comes to living objects. So if evolution's true and God doesn't exist, we resemble each other to varying degrees of resemblance, but there is no such thing as that's the standard of human. So we, we are all humans to one degree or another. Secondly, if there's no God, being a human just means to have a DNA of a certain structure. It doesn't mean that you've got value. How can you get value from having a DNA of a certain structure? So in a godless world, being a human devalues to having a belly button. It can't be a legitimate source of moral treatment, if you ask me. Now, so I look at the world, and I could go on and on, and I look at the world, and I basically say the world began to exist. It is fine-tuned for life to appear. 
There's incredible information in living things that can only come from an intelligent mind. I know there's an objective moral law, and so does everybody else, and I don't know how you can get that from a cloud of electron gas. Um, it, it makes sense that there had to be some kind of a moral a, a, a lawgiver with character that willed the moral law, and I think equal rights is intuitively right, and the only explanation to undergird those intuitions is that if we all exist in the image of God and have that in common, even though we vary in other ways, and that makes sense only if there's a God who made us in His image. Now, I could, give, I could go other, other things, but I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> now, so, so, so then I ask myself the question, why should I be a Christian? And I'm going to give you three reasons for why you should adopt Christianity. Number one, pick a religion, pick a religion whose picture of God harmonizes with what we know about God from creation. Pick a religion whose picture of God harmonizes with what we know about God from creation. Now, let me explain. The arguments that I just gave you for a supreme being support monotheism, that there's one supreme being, not polytheism. Because many gods are not needed to explain the origin of the universe, the fine-tuning, the moral law. One will do. And so the arguments from creation that I've offered you don't just support any old sort of a God, they support the existence of one high supreme being who is intelligent and has moral character. So you ought to pick a monotheistic religion <clears throat> as your religion. That rules out Hinduism and Buddhism because they're not monotheistic. Now, why am I using monotheism as a criterion? Not because the Bible is monotheistic. That would be cheating at this point. It's because the creation is best explained by one personal God. That's why. The evidence I've given you is best explained if there's one personal being with a free will and a moral character and is capable of designing things like DNA. You don't need 50 or 330 million of them if one will do the job of explaining the data. Okay? No, number two. <clears throat> Pick a religion that best diagnoses, that best diagnoses and solves the human condition. Pick a religion that best diagnoses and solves the human condition. So, so what I'm, by the human condition I mean, what's wrong with us? You ought to pick a religion that does the best job of diagnosing what's wrong with us and, and presenting a solution for that. This is common sense. Why would you pick a religion that doesn't do as good a job of providing solutions to our problems? If you had two religions, you ought to pick the one that does the best job. Now, I'm claiming, and I, I don't have time to go into this, but I'm claiming that the religion of Jesus does a better job of any other religion in dealing with things like guilt and shame, alienation, so not only is the human condition constituted by guilt and shame, which it is, but alienation. Human beings are not only alienated from God, they're alienated from each other and from themselves. They don't even get along with themselves half the time. They can't live consistently with their own values. Why is that? And what can be done about it? Um, I could, uh, human beings hunger for meaning and purpose in life. Um, there's so much more. Human beings know they need empowerment to do better than they can do on their own. They need help. They need some kind of empowerment to do better than they can simply muster up on their own efforts. I'll tell you one that works with Muslims. That's, uh, I've used this many times with Muslims. And that is human beings desire an intimate love relationship with a supreme being that loves them dearly. Allah doesn't, there's no tender-hearted love that comes from Allah. Allah is a 
distant lawgiver. And I said to one Muslim, I said, you know the favorite word Jesus used for God was daddy, papa, abba? He's, Jesus is communicating that God wants a tender, familial, intimate love affair with his children. And, and, and your religion doesn't offer that. So I'm suggesting that Christian, I'm not suggesting other religions don't offer something. I'm suggesting that on balance, the best diagnosis of what's wrong with us and the best solution is the religion of Jesus. That's the second reason I'm a Christian. Here's the third reason. Pick a religion that claim that has supernatural backing behind it. Pick a religion that has supernatural backing behind it. Muhammad goes in a cave and says, I got the Quran from an angel. Trust me, I, this is the word of God. Not so with the Christian religion. We have two pieces of supernatural evidence that the Christian religion is true. Fulfill prophecy and historical evidence for miracles in the resurrection. So fulfilled prophecy. Jesus fulfilled hundreds of prophecies written centuries before he came. And books like Josh McDowell or Lee Strobel, I've written a book called The God Question. If you want to, by the way, I've got a website, jpmoreland.com. There are free downloads of all my writings and my lectures. If you want them, you can get them free on there. So, so jpmoreland.com. But in a book called The God Question I wrote, I delineate all the historical evidence that the Gospels are historically reliable and that Jesus really did do the miracles and raise from the dead. One of the reasons I'm a Christian is Jesus rose from the dead and Muhammad and Buddha didn't. And there's evidence for that. It's not, it's not a blind faith. There's evidence that Jesus' tomb actually is, was empty and that's a historic fact. So at this point, I would appeal to historical apologetics. Okay? Now let me summarize, because we're out of time, let me summarize in the following way. Why am I a monotheist? Because the origin of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe, the information in living things, the need for a ground for the absolute moral law and a lawgiver, the, a need for the, something to ground equal human rights, all of these things add up to me that there is one personal God. So what religion ought I pick? I ought to pick a monotheistic religion that says there's only one God. So, Hindu, so, so Islam and Judaism and Christianity would still be in the running on that first principle, but Buddhism and Hinduism would be out because they can't explain how, the, the facts that I've listed. Secondly, pick a religion that does the best job of diagnosing the human situation and providing the best solution, and I think Jesus' religion does that. And third, pick a religion that has supernatural backing, and in Christianity we have historical evidence for miracles in the resurrection and messianic prophecy. Now, one more thing. At this point, then, I'll tell a person perform a devotional experiment and step into the Christian religion, confess as best you can your need for Jesus and his forgiveness, and begin to read the Gospels and start calling out to Jesus and practicing it and see what happens. And I believe at this point the test of religious experience will confirm what we know from creation and other kinds of things. Folks, th thanks for coming to a conference like this and being interested. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.